Our next speaker is Dr. Stephanie Simmons, the founder and chief quantum officer at Photonic Incorporated. Um, as David noted, she's also the co-chair of the advisory board for Canada's national quantum strategy. Uh, Dr. Simmons is a world-leading expert in quantum technologies, condensed spin dynamics and control, and silicon spin photonic interfaces. Um, she's an international speaker with over numerous publications and keynotes, and her work has been awarded several, um, several awards and recognitions that uh, I will not go through right now. Uh, but please, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I've been looking forward to give this talk for about seven years. Um, I didn't know it would be here. I think it's very appropriate that it's here because in some sense, uh, Chicago and, and the US more broadly has been really investing in, in quantum tech for decades, like decades, decades. I got, in, I got into this 20 years ago. And the dream was always to figure out how to actually make this all work, how to, how to build something that you can rely on as a quantum technology and that can scale. Um, so reliable quantum technologies have really, really high requirements, and it's always been this big push to like, what, what can possibly deliver those requirements? But then secondly, okay, fine, if you can get something to be reliable, and that looks actually on the near term now, some, some demonstration of reliable, fault-tolerant quantum operations. But again, one perfect qubit is perfectly useless, right? So we have to think about how to scale this to deliver the really exciting things that we've all been waiting for and for all the things that we haven't yet seen, all the algorithms from Quantum Algorithm Zoo, top to bottom, mapped to all the possible applications across the world that, again, we haven't really spent that many cycles on as a, as a, um, as a species to try and figure out exactly all the different ways that we can make use of this technology. So what I'm gonna share with you today is you know, my version of the answer to David's question, well, how do you get 100,000? I think, I think what we can work backwards from success and, and realize a few different lessons on how we can think about scalable, fault-tolerant quantum technologies. And it's, you'll hear a lot of ideas that you probably already have heard, <laughs> but we're combining them in a way that I think is very exciting. And it points to how quickly this is going to change, because this is going to change on a dime. Um, and I think what's really exciting is that by the ecosystem here, you guys are really well suited to be able to change on a dime and run with it. But um, yeah, we'll see, we'll see where this goes. So I've been thinking about quantum systems engineering for a, for a while now, because it's not sufficient to just focus on the performance of any one quantum object, nor is it sufficient to only focus on scale. You really need to think about something that can handle both. And um, this is very, very common in technology development. So if you go and take a look at any disruptive technology of quantum, of course, is going to be one of them. It goes through a life cycle. And so I'm borrowing a term from an econo um, economics literature that's called dominant design. And it just reflects the fact that once something's a commodity, it all kind of looks the same, right? So, you know, we, right now we have commodity railways and phones and microwaves and airplanes almost, right? Like it's, there's like a standard design that things have converged to and that's where it starts to get about price and weight and, and that kind of side of things. But before that, you have an explosion of different approaches. And this is always the case, right? You can go back to any disruptive technology in the early days when things start to move out of the academic world. There's an explosion, almost a Cambrian explosion of different approaches and methods. And that is absolutely the phase we're in with quantum right now. There's at least a dozen different approaches to arrive at, eventually, this vision of scalable, fault-tolerant, or rather reliable quantum technologies, all kinds of quantum technologies, right? Like, that's that vision. And there is not consensus. There is absolutely not consensus yet. Um, but that will come. There will be a phase where the world all starts rowing the boat in the same direction on quantum technologies. And I don't know when that's going to happen, 
but this is, uh, I think, going to be an interesting thing to watch. And this is where you have the most opportunity to contribute to that, um, to that vision in this earlier stage. So I've been working backwards, as it were, intellectually from what such a thing could look like. And I've arrived individually at a few different lessons that I would like to share for this audience just to maybe spark the conversation and get things hopefully moving a little bit faster in the right direction. And so I'm gonna give you four lessons. <laughs> and I, I, I call them Steph's lessons because I'm not speaking on behalf of the Canadian government. This is, this is just me and my, my observations. And you can, they're, not, they're axioms as it were, so they could be wrong. But I think if we agreed upon this, then you kind of arrive at a certain uh, logical conclusion that really can um, paint the picture of something moving very fast, very quickly. So I think the first lesson is that scale must mean that when you add a resource, it doesn't get harder, right? If you have something that's scalable, that means if you're adding a qubit or adding something, it can't make it harder. Because um, at that point, you have some kind of self-limiting system, which could be big, quite big. But if it doesn't allow for scalability, then you're in a troubled situation. So my, con my conclusion from this is that we're going to need to go modular. And as soon as you make that assumption, everything else follows. Everything else follows. So that allows you to do horizontal scalability. This is exactly what supercomputing has done, right? Or the internet. You have to be able to be able to rack mount, essentially, and horizontally scale your system, because then you have arbitrary system size. But getting that working is really tough, really tough, but it also puts certain constraints and certain opportunities in front of us. If you're working on a modular quantum system, this is a very, this seems like a really technical thing and I'll walk you through it, but basically the IO, the input output, the quantum IO is absolutely gonna govern the performance of the large scale system. And there is, I think, one paper in the, on this topic, maybe two, in all of quantum literature. Like, if you take a look at how many quantum resources you're going to need to execute Shor's algorithm or your favorite chemical simulation or whatever the reliable quantum algorithm is you want to do, it's actually going to be completely dictated by the I.O. of your modular system. This is way more than classical supercomputing. For classical supercomputing, you can just stick a transceiver on the edge and use that to communicate through all your modules. For quantum, it's very different and it places constraints on what kind of qubits you would want to be developing. The quality, in addition to the quantity, matters. So this gives you some kind of practical guidelines on what sorts of systems you might want to develop and we'll get into that in a second and why we've picked our specific implementation at Photonic. And the last one, and this is the most exciting one, Researchers that have been far off in theory land have absolutely made all of our efforts 20 years closer, all of them. Everybody has a position now which is about 20 years closer to realizing reliable quantum technology by virtue of the fact that you know, brilliant mathematicians have been doing brilliant things. And by connecting that and engineering for the best codes that are out there, we've been optimizing for the wrong thing for decades. Connectivity is going to be the thing that brings us reliable quantum technology sooner. All right, so I'll walk through those. Modular systems. You really do want to have a system where you can not just work about with one system, but many of them. And this is because, for the very simple reason that building reliable quantum technologies, no matter what code you use, is really hard. You're going to have to hit some very high performance metrics that is very, very difficult to do. And every single time you have a constraint like that, you're going to need to constrain, in most of the systems under investigation, the environment somehow. The environment's going to need to be tightly controlled to reduce fluctuations that will keep reliable computing from happening. And if that's the case, then you have a box. <laughs> Right? You, and that's true for basically all the quantum systems that you're looking at right now. There is a box, and there's only so many qubits you can fit into said box before it gets easier to have more than one box. 
And this seems to be around 1,000, could be maybe stretched up to a couple thousand, maybe 10,000, but at some point, it's gonna be easier to have multiple boxes talking together than it is to be ever pushing bigger and bigger and bigger boxes from an engineering perspective. This is a very practical argument. This isn't like a necessary argument, but if you're going on that basis, then regardless of the quantum system, you're gonna to have to really be thinking about what it looks like to link multiple systems together. All right, this is for my quantum people in the audience. Let's just take a look at what it would look like to have one interconnect between two fault tolerant modules and lots of interconnects between fault tolerant modules, right? So let's suppose we're working with a CSS code. Okay, very technical. But you can put all of those qubits together, those seven qubits in each of those modules into one logical qubit if you had as many nines and fidelity as you wanted, right? Okay, fine. Now, your logical operations between those two things can go, in one case, is amazing, and the other case is disastrous, right? So in the case where you actually can have interconnects between multiple modules, you can do operations between those qubits directly. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here. To do a logical operation between a logical qubit on one side and the logical qubit on the other side, you're gonna need to have each of the physical qubits underpinning that logical qubit talking to each other, right? And that's a good case, that's the ideal case, right? So you're gonna need not just one bit of entanglement or one CNOC gate, you're gonna need lots. So this is not like the classical supercomputing where you stick a transceiver on the edge. This really is a situation where if you do that, you have dramatic slowdowns to implement the same kind of operation, right? And again, so this is for my, my quantum people in the audience, but hopefully it you know, rattles the cage a little bit. Interconnects matter. Interconnects are gonna absolutely dictate the scalability of, of the system. And it's so much so that every single qubit you're working with needs a quantum interconnect for the ideal performance at scale. Right? So this is this underappreciated, like it's, the observation has been made many, many times again, but I think driving home that point points you to a certain kind of qubit. And really, it's qubits that can talk to photons and have memory. And so it's one of these things where there's lots of different possible implementations of qubits that talk to photons and qubits that have memory. I mean, some of it is really led in the world here in Chicago but ion traps fit that category and to some extent neutral atoms. And you know, there's systems out there that speak to photons and have a memory. I think really that is what you'd wanna go for if you're gonna be optimizing on IO. And it sounds like a small deal, but it's gonna absolutely dictate the performance of these things. Now, but once you do that, once you do that, you're already thinking about the computer as a network. And so the one flag I would like to raise, wave in this talk is to say, we should stop thinking about quantum networking and quantum computing as separate things. They are one and the same. They are one and the same in the limiting case because it's all about, frankly, distributing entanglement, all of it, all of it. And we should be optimizing on that because that's gonna be the thing that dictates the performance of the computer and of the network. So this is our pet qubit, but really, again, there's, there's many instances of essentially spin photon interfaces that could tick this bill. But photons get lost, <laughs> they do get lost, and so one of the things you really do have to think about quite carefully is which kind of photon and how are you gonna collect it? Because if they get lost, that's the bottleneck of your computer. If you can't get the photons where they need to be, the entanglement isn't being distributed and you're gonna slow down your system. So we have double clicked on a defect, it's a solid state defect called the T-Center. I went hunting for it um, because I wanted to find it and it existed exactly where we wanted it to, right in the telecom O band. Because when you're working with telecom light, you lose as little as possible, right? So if you want the highest possible computing system, you don't want any transduction, you don't want any of that, right? All of that's gonna be bulky and lossy. So you wanna pick something that works deliberately right at telecom if you can, if you can. But the second one is that solid state systems are really helpful because <laughs> you can basically print them right into fiber optics and silicon photonics, as we heard, is, is its own important con uh, contributing factor to quantum technologies for the ability to essentially print whatever optical circuit you'd like right into the silicon. So this is ours. You can have your own, but I would think that you know, putting this together, this, this approach 
which we um, shared online last week, you can go take a look, um, can be broadly applied to all kinds of different color centers and all kinds of different materials. But really, if you're gonna be optimizing for entanglement distribution, you wanna collect all of that light and you would like it to be at telecom already. And so this comes to the final observation of the four lessons, which is to say that, you know, what have we been pushing on in, as, as a ecosystem for the past 20 years? We've just wanted more and more nines, right? We're like, we want higher fidelity, longer coherence, we want more nines, more higher fidelity. Fidelity is what you need because those early error correction fault tolerant codes that came out in the 90s required it. But there's this entire branch of work called QLDPC codes, which I, have any of you heard of? How many people have heard of LDPC codes? Oh, that's so much better than it was even a year ago. So like, if, you, if you looked at that a year ago, there, was one, there would be one person. Basically what you're thinking about is um, uh, there are way better codes than what has been the established best practice quantum code. And it's because we kind of went at it the wrong way. We were thinking, okay, fine. What's, what's the best possible code that has the least physical requirements? Okay, let's assume proximity. Let's assume that our two cubic gates have to be next to one another. And that gives you what's called the surface code. Sorry, sorry, technical. I know, too technical. But that code's kind of horrible in some sense. You need really, really high overheads. You need something like thousands and thousands of physical qubits for one reliable logical qubit. And remember, one logical qubit's exactly useless, right? We need thousands of logical qubits to do these big algorithms that we're really excited about that you just can't do any other way. Okay. But let's work backwards from our modular system. If we have a modular system and all of our qubits have I.O., we can connect them any way we want. We're not constrained to nearest neighbor anything, right? If we're gonna be double clicking on entanglement distribution and giving all of our qubits a telecom interface, telecoms, photons go everywhere, like you link them however you want. You have whatever topology you would like, and therefore you have whatever connectivity you want, and therefore you can use the world's best codes. So we go from having surface code or planar codes, overheads of thousands, LDPC codes, go take a look at them. They have overheads as low as three, and for very reasonable parameters, and the same thresholds and the same overheads, overheads of like 20. They have brought, those, those teams of humans that are working around the world on pure academic research have made this an economic reality for all of us 20 years sooner, just based upon the fact that these codes, again, 5G codes, they've been made quantum, and they are gorgeous. So why aren't we designing for that? Well, I'm proposing that we do. Connectivity is what we've been missing. So here, just a sketch of one version of how you can get 100,000 logical qubits eventually. We're talking about integrated photonics for us. The T-center goes into a cavity, collects all the light, really high collection efficiencies, goes through switches and detectors, and you just rack mount it. You just rack mount it. And better yet, and this is where it gets into the network side, the network is the computer. This is exactly what a repeater is, right? It's the exact same technology that you need to unlock networked repeaters, network communications, quantum, quantum networks over large distances as well as local. These are technical slides. I'm just gonna give them one minute each for the super technical people in the audience just to see what it looks like. But really what you do is when you put these things into a cavity, you get light boosted the way you want. And then you use, you consume the entanglement for what's called the teleported gate. So this is again, just connecting the dots, but these are really old protocols. So you can look at emission and you can get interference. So that means that these qubits don't need to be near each other at all. Any two qubits in your network can get logic gates between them. If you also wanted to take a look at how this connects into networks, you can have modules at room temperature users that link into the quantum network by essentially teleporting into the network as well. So for everybody you know, still paying attention, if you actually, if your eyes are open and you're paying attention, you're excited by this, go take a look at the perspective paper that we shared last week because it goes into a lot more detail. 
Last week, we announced a $100 million funding raise, as well as a collaboration um, with Microsoft to co-innovate this technology for networked quantum computing at scale. So it's a really exciting time for us, but I honestly think it's a really, really exciting time for the field, where everybody is starting to realize how important modular networked quantum systems are for realizing the dream that we all have, right? Unleashing new powers that aren't gonna be unlocked any other way which we've been working on for decades. So if you are interested, please do take a look. We're hiring lots of positions at the moment um, and would like to collaborate with everybody because honestly, the, f the sooner we all get moving in the right direction and the sooner we can realize this, I think the better it is gonna be for everybody. So with that, thank you. If you want to come take a look at what I think is the world's first million qubit chip, it's up here. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, questions for, for Dr. Simmons? Back there. Thank you so much for the beautiful talk. I was wondering, uh, what do you think would be the uh, fidelity limit for the two qubit gate and what uh, Fidelity limit. Fidelity two, limit. Yeah, for the two qubit gate and what approach you uh, adopt for yeah. implementing that. So we, we do go into some details on uh, in the perspective. Three nines is possible but hard. So I have a question, provocative, a little bit like the China one before. Uh, of course, um, I mean, this is amazing. It's a dream. Um, but we as a society and we as a university are also very concerned with climate change and sustainability in terms of energy. So c can you tell us how much energy this all requires now and will require? And is it sustainable? That's a brilliant question. So these systems actually... Um, aren't as energy intensive if you go, if you compare like to like for the few algorithms where you want to. But what I get up in the morning for is the fact that these systems, once realized, will be fit for purpose for actually designing catalysts. What the catalyst? We have no tools fit for purpose for designing catalysts. Catalysts underpin the entire energy industry because it makes one chemical into something else, right? Or one material into something else. And right now, it is really a just chuck something at the wall and see what sticks. When we have tools that are actually capable of designing things to efficiently translate one material into another, uh, in one chemical to another, then we're going to be really cooking with gas, as it were. <laughs> bad, bad phrase. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll be in a situation where we can help there from, a, from an information standpoint. If, so it is, it is, you know, there's more than one way that this talks about the future. Right? There's more than one way where this technology needs to relate to, to that one, but that's the one that I'm most excited about. Any other questions? So the center that you showed, I'm not familiar with it, but it has the two carbon atoms and it has the hydrogen there. It looks like it might be difficult to create in a kind of reproducible and reliable way. Can you comment on how easy it is to There's a million right this? here. Yes. Are there other things that are made at the same time? Um, none that seem to be causing too much trouble. Um, they are naturally forming defect in the sense that um, it was, it's called the T-Center because back in the 70s and the 80s when the silicon industry was really going, um, they were taking a look at what would happen to silicon if it was damaged in space because it was being used in space. And so this is a naturally forming thing in the sense that you can kind of put um, certain constituents and it naturally forms. So uh, yeah, that's the method that we chose, and correspondingly, it actually can form rather efficiently, but even though the, the molecule itself is rather complicated. So, Stephanie, a quick question. You, you talked just now about um, predicting materials and designing materials, and that will take a very powerful machine, and uh, that will need, uh, you know, an error-corrected machine. And, and you spoke about fault tolerance and so on in your talk. Uh, when do you think we'll be able to demonstrate robust fault tolerance experimentally? I think less than five years. Okay. So, um, yeah, you talked about remarkable progress, but what challenges would you have for the audience? What technologies are you still missing? So, mm. I think um, there's going to be quite a bit of 
there's quite a lot of work to do overall. Like as, as was shared earlier, people haven't even heard of the tea center. Uh, <laughs> we went hunting for it, but there's a lot of foundational work to be done. There's a lot of, um, Oh my gosh, the systems engineering side is, has been really lacking. So for example, even just crunching the algorithms into the smallest possible uh, size, that's one effort, but how do you do that over a modular system in an error corrected way? I mean, there's just so much work to be done there. These codes, yes, they're beautiful. Um, we've been making good progress on how to do the best kind of operations within those codes, but again, way more work to be done. At the moment, because of this um, segmentation, this early segmentation in the quantum space, there isn't this kind of holistic co-design opportunity happening. So one of the reasons that we started sharing publicly what we're up to, because we've been up to this for a while, is to get more and more teams engaged with this effort, this broader system level engineering effort, which I think is, is needed. That more interconnect is better. Mm -hmm. um, the sketch you showed had every, you know, qubit one connected to one, two to two is, more connections better is being able to have arbitrary interconnect more interesting. Yeah, thank you. So when we're, um, I think both. I think the point is that once you are in a situation where you assume that each qubit has its own interconnect capability, then there's no reason to constrain yourself to a hardwired link necessarily. Um, this is, comes back to the previous question about systems engineering. How do we think about logical operations between modules, right? Um, I see reasons for the ability to re-orient, re, um, re-navigate re that, and I can get into reasons why in due course, but uh, even just a hardwired one, like it, it just opens up that opportunity. It's a design opportunity to thinking much more broadly about how these things are going, and as soon as you do that, then you have these new codes at your disposal, right? So, Thank you. Um, I'm sharing questions from our virtual attendees. Um, so. This question comes from Ron Schreiner. What is the benefit of T centers over NV and diamonds? I think one, one thing is transduction. One's silicon, one's telecom. But the question is still open. Can you get it to deliver the performance, right? So ultimately, if you can find another telecom center, another solid state material, I mean, all of, those, all of these lessons apply equally well there. And they all deserve really, really focused attention. Um, because what I don't know are the unknown unknowns, right? So there can be something that comes up over the next couple of years that blocks progress on this particular color center. But I think the general principle holds that we need really high fidelity operation to be able to, even with high connectivity, deliver on, on fault tolerant operations and scalability. So I think uh, the people are, it's, it's all gonna kind of close. It's all in the right direction, but there is a lot of work to be done and lots of effort to, um, be poured into not just the T center but other other color centers to deliver that. So I had I had a question for you. Um, so you know, quantum science has always been very guided very strongly by theory, almost you know, experiments following theoretical predictions and and proving it. Um, in conventional technologies, there's a lot of intuitive stuff that goes on. Uh, you talked about QLDPC codes, right? The LDPC codes came out in 1993, at least rejuvenated by you know, three French engineers who had no idea much about the theory behind it. What do you see the role of just intuitive stuff in quantum science and technology, people trying things out? So with the quantum QLDPC codes, even like two years ago, three years ago, there's lines in some papers saying, even though this could be, never be physically built, because they were presupposing proximity-based interactions. I think um, there's some intuition, there's a, maybe just to not answer your question, there's a lot of intuition that emerges once we start thinking on a systems level and we start talking to each other more. And so that's one of the reasons why I appreciate efforts like this, because frankly, I think one of the reasons when we, we aren't having this conversation 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, is because we haven't been talking to each other. Even, even the networking and computing distinction, I think, has is, is been leading us astray for a long time, where you have networking people, oh, we gotta build a repeater, but ah. Uh, but it's a computer, <laughs> you know, like it's a computer. And, and the same thing with computers, the, compu the problem with scaling for computers is that it needs a network. And so these, these instinctual lessons are a lot more obvious if we were to talk more um, and talk earlier. So more systems level 
there's not one quantum conference, right? There's, there's all these different segmentations. So um, I think there's opportunity there. Right. Thanks. Time for one last question, right at the back there. Hi. Um, you mentioned a lot about the QRDBC code. So uh, I think this might be your uh, way forward uh, for Photon Incorporated. So uh, yeah, QRDBC code, well, it's a very good quality memory with very high rate, constant rate. But as far as I know, the photon logical gate might be a problem between. Nope. Yeah. So. Yeah, I wonder, so if you have any ideas for the implementation of it in your physical system. Yep. Oh yeah, I guess, okay, then it might be a secret then. Many. Sure, thank you, <laughs> yeah, okay. So I think with that brief response, we'll uh, <laughs> conclude uh, the morning session.